<laughs> the next morning, we gathered for breakfast. Very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. It was a pleasure. So, how are you feeling this morning? Very well. Very well. I feel great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How about you, you, go, are you both being similar? Or are you. I don't know, how do you feel? I think I we're feeling more Gabby. similar now than we were yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> In the library, we watched a recording of some of the events of the previous day. I can almost see the music coming out of um, the stereo. Um, it's not a colour, it's just, I don't know, imagine like a car zipping by and you make... I could see things more clearly. All colours were sort of enhanced and um, there are lots more differences between different colours, like I'd look at, you know, all the greenness in front of me, normally just look like greenness, fields and trees, but when I looked at it yesterday, I mean, there are like so many different greens, and there are very sort of different shades of green. Yes. Is that because you're more focused on a very specific area of your visual field? It, it felt like it was because my senses were more open, and I was hearing the slightest thing, you know. It's almost, I could hear like every bird in the vicinity, and I was much more aware what my senses were picking up. Do, do you listen to a lot of music? I mean, are you aware of what sound does? Uh, I mean, when you've got a speaker going and there's an obstacle, you're, you're, you're aware of it's bouncing back? Yes. yes. So you're making use of all these things that are already in your mind, your expectations, and you're giving them visual form? Yeah. That could be it, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I do realise that sound bounces off things. You know, it comes in the form of waves. You were being tested by Joanna on your uh, perception yeah. and she was asking you to identify various patterns yeah. and at one point you decided that the patterns were changing and that you no longer could participate in the test. Mm. Tell us a little bit more about what was happening, what you were seeing and why you said that. Yeah. It just, the whole experience just felt quite strange and alien, like why, why were they you know, now I can realise why they were testing, you know, whether I had a sort of memory of the same shapes, but it became irrelevant because the shapes were changing in front of my eyes, you know, like a, um, a V sign sort of became like a zigzaggy line and, I don't know, blues were changing to greens slightly and squares were turning to ovals. The only way I could describe what it looked like is, is like when you're driving down a hot road and you see that heat haze on the road, that shimmering. Or, you know, you get it in the desert as well. But that, that's what it looked like to me, and that was, that was fascinating. It stood out from my hand, about two centimetres, all around my hand, and I saw it around your head. It was very distinct. So would you say that this was a particularly powerful and important experience to you personally? Definitely. I mean, it was, it was a very strong experience. Um, it's, it's nothing like I've ever experienced. It's, it's hard to compare it to anything else. It's like asking somebody to describe what it's like to be drunk to somebody who's never been drunk before. I mean, you can say I felt a bit dizzy or, you know, I felt a bit ill, but you can never convey completely that sensation. And what, what I was feeling was, like, very distinct. Reflecting on the results of the tests, it was clear that they'd been mixed. Perception had been altered, and in Ed's case, he'd experienced empathy with nature and seen auras. While Johnny's experience seemed to come from a visualization of his knowledge of sound waves. But there'd been no distortions of size, and we had not been able to account directly for the fly agarics connection with fairies and little people. So, Michael, what do you think you've learned from what you've seen? We've made perhaps the first short step towards a deeper understanding of the way the mind works. We've seen that a possible way of investigating the functions of the mind exists within the chemistry of the Amanita muscaria. And we've also identified two subjects who might be described as psychonauts who at some stage could perhaps help us develop a cartography of the conscious mind. As scientists, 
Joanna and Cosmo were rather more sceptical. I think what we currently have are very good tests of memory function, for example. Uh, but what we don't have is a test of how amazing the feeling is. And I think that um, what I can tell you is about the nuts and bolts, which relates very closely to those feelings, but um, actually has an inverse relationship. I don't think we've learnt a great deal about the brain chemistry, and I don't think we've learnt anything about little people, uh, the other world, and dwarves and elves. And I say that because both of the boys had different experiences. None of them talked about uh, small objects, distortions in size. None of them had, as far as I know, hallucinations and saw things that weren't there. They may have had slight distortions of perception. When we tested their distortions of perception, they were actually not even true illusions. They were, they, they, they were false interferences with what they were seeing. Cosmo did, however, have a theory to explain the visual effects experienced by the volunteers. The phenomenon that I observe is the human brain is very good at pattern recognition. And if, it, if you give it one stimulus and another one, it'll very quickly make a link between the two. And usually the link is true. We're very good at fitting patterns into the world. But when the brain is being mm. disorganized and disinhibited and mm. clues are taken away from it, it'll start inventing the missing gaps. People used hallucinogens in the 60s as a way of exploring the mind and they were used therapeutically before this was put a stop to by the authorities. And a lot of patients ex described extremely bad experiences as a result of the therapeutic use of LSD. And of course the current research that is taking place is to measure if and to what extent the brain is damaged yeah. permanently by taking hallucinogens. So I think one has to be slightly careful about advocating them as a therapeutic tool. Who has been advocating them as a therapeutic tool? Not, I don't think well, anyone in this group has been. And I, I, I would, I, I would suggest... Tool. Mm. Oh, no, this, this, absolutely yes. wrong. This is, I want to make a crucial point here. Mm. It's very crucial right now in the history of science. There is a clear distinction. One person in this group, and perhaps others, would like to exclude an entire class of botanical and organic substances from scientific research. And I want to demur from that opinion because I think they are very important and potentially powerful instruments for investigating the mind. You're giving a very positive uh, description of what you've seen, and yet from the other side, one is receiving a description which is one of disablement and impairment. How do we square these two accounts of the same experience? From one perspective, certain functions of the mind might well be impaired while enhancing other unmeasurable or at least heretofore unmeasurable functions that are still taking place within the mind as we well know from the reports we received this weekend. That seems to be an important item of disagreement yeah. because... No, no, I, I, I would agree with, with Michael, absolutely. I think what I can really report is the facts but I fully agree that there is a whole level above that that we cannot explore because we do not, so far, have the means. And exploring human consciousness was exactly what Michael thought we should be doing. I think an interesting project deriving from the findings of this weekend might well be to look forward to a new wave mm. of technology within science which might equip us with more powerful instrumentation to examine what must be regarded as one of the most crucial issues facing civilization today. As my guests departed, I was left to reflect on the fascinating events of the last three days. There's little doubt that the fly agaric dramatically affects human emotions and perceptions. In ancient societies, this could well have given reality to a belief in natural spirits. But nothing that had happened over the weekend have persuaded my guests to change their initial opinions. Those effects were a mere mental distortion or a gateway to another reality. As with our volunteers, what the scientists had derived from the experience seemed to depend on what they had brought to it. But I was in no doubt that the experiment had been worthwhile. And there were many other plants still to 